He's a YouTuber.com. Is that taken? <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna take you through YouTube right now. Okay. Roberto, just quickly, is more than just a YouTube creator. He's an educator, and that's what he loves to do. And he has over a decade of experience educating people and helping them to create things that are awesome. Which is his name is Digital Agency. He creates something awesome. So if you want to know about YouTube and how to make money on YouTube, right? how to do it right, we're gonna learn this, Roberto. We're gonna learn it. We're going to do it right now, and Roberto's got a great deck. It's going to be exciting, so you'll learn something here. Thank you. Alex, let's go. Hey, everybody. How are we doing today? I hope you guys are doing awesome. So my name is Roberto Blake of Create Awesome Media, helping you create something awesome today. That's a little inside joke with uh, my viewers, because it's what I teach them to do each and every single day. And the way that I leverage YouTube in my personal brand is because I'm a creative entrepreneur and an online educator. So let me go ahead and break down for you what we're gonna be covering in today's session with YouTube. Right now, how many of you are utilizing YouTube right now for your brand or your business? Show of hands real quick. All right, so at least a few of you, that is fantastic. We already had some of the presenters speak on the fact that search engines are important and the context of them is changing each and every day. A lot of them are implementing something very scary called machine learning, AKA what I grew up with calling Skynet. So uh, that's a lot of fun, right, to have to deal with that. But in the context of our business, it's actually really important because we can leverage these content experiences to create value for people, whether it's in educating our consumers, whether it's expanding and growing our personal brand, or whether it's demonstrating our products and service and explaining them in a way that's fun and informative and gets people engaged and influences a buying decision. So today, what I wanna talk about is I wanna kind of introduce you to some of these concepts, tell you about bringing uh, your personal brand to YouTube as a content platform, not just as a search engine, how you can build credibility in your niche through this. Some of the best practices, because I know YouTube and all these platforms get overwhelming and confusing. I want to give you a foundation to execute and be successful. And then we're also gonna talk about understanding content strategy, what quality content is, because I don't think anyone has ever quantified quality content really in the way that they need to. Then we're gonna talk about strategies that actually convert for your business and how you can build community and engagement to forge more trust. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And I really want want you to be intentional about all of this and let's go ahead and jump right into it. So I'm Roberto Blake, I'm a creative entrepreneur and the reason that I understand YouTube in the context of personal branding is because I actually did it. I did over 1,000 videos on YouTube alone, 1,000 pieces of unique content, not anything repurposed, not anything that was just, you know, hashed from something else, all original content on my own and what I did was I played to my strengths. I had a background in advertising and graphic design. I had a background in web design and development. I have experience as a marketer from corporate America before deciding to go out on my own and be an entrepreneur. I've been a creative my entire life. I grew up as an illustrator. Everyone in my family was a photo enthusiast. None of them went full time with it. I was determined to make it on my ability as a creative professional so that instead of saving my creativity for my nights and weekends, I could do it for my nine to five. And I accomplished that. And when that wasn't satisfying anymore, I went on my own and building my personal brand, building my own website, having that ranking in Google search, taking the name Roberto Blake and Google away from Robert Blake, which was a task in and of itself, was something that was important. And it gave me an understanding of how search engine optimization is valuable when building out your brand and when people are looking for you, especially when they want to do follow up. And then with YouTube, I realized there's an opportunity. It meant that if I present well in person and I'm making great personal connections, what if I could do that and be omnipresent? What if instead of doing that one-to-one, -one, I could scale it? Video is the opportunity for you to be your best self and be omnipresent at the same time. One of the things I love about YouTube is YouTube and my website compete every month for employee of the month. And the best thing is they never call out, they never get sick, and they never ask me for a raise. So that's just something that I really think is valuable to you is to use this thing to work for you 24 seven. 
365 and at scale. I've also done over a thousand live streams on the other platforms, not just YouTube, but Facebook, Instagram, Periscope, and Twitter. And I built a community of over a quarter of a million creative entrepreneurs, creative professionals, and creative services enthusiasts in my platform. This has opened up opportunities for me to become a public speaker in the last two years and work with great brands like Adobe and Dell and HP, among others. So that's what the power of YouTube has done for me, but it's in the context of my personal brand. Who is Roberto Blake? What can he teach me? What do I benefit from them? And sometimes people aren't looking for Roberto Blake. What they're looking for is how do I make a social media header in Photoshop? How do I start editing in Adobe Premiere Pro? How do I become a graphic designer? How do I become a creative entrepreneur? These are problems that people search for each and every day. And in the context of your personal brand, you can take ownership of a problem and offer the solution. So whatever it is that you have experience in, whatever you are a practitioner of, you don't even have to be the leading expert. The thing is, to the person who is starting at zero, you are a godsend. You are help to that person to just be more informed and more educated. If you can present to them in a way that nobody else has, if you can give them context, if you can make something less intimidating, or you can make something that seems mundane to some people, very exciting for them and not overwhelming, you win. And you have the opportunity to do that by just being authentic and telling your story. What was your experience in the world? What was your experience in this industry? How did you get started? What was your experience in pursuing your education? because that will resonate with the other person and the story of who you are is very important. Is there anyone here who uh, is a fan of the HBO series Game of Thrones? A couple of people? A few of you, right? So if I were to say a Lannister always pays their debts, you know exactly who I'm talking about. You know that I'm talking about House Lannister, uh, one of the wealthiest houses in the uh, series and that you know that the context of that saying is their brand, is their story. That's a threat and a promise that we reward our allies and we punish our enemies. So that's the story of them. Your name goes before you like a banner. So when you create content, you're giving people a basis for who you are and what you've done. It is your body of work. And using YouTube as a platform for your body of work is very valuable. So in bringing your personal brand to a content platform, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, whatever it is, you need to ask yourself some questions. What is it that you're really good at? What are you confident enough to speak at intelligently? And who is that valuable to? What is truly exciting to you? What are you passionate about? What are you going to be able to sustainably produce 100, 1,000 pieces of content around without it becoming a chore for you, without it becoming something that becomes a problem to sustain and keep momentum with and to bring energy and excitement to? Because the thing is, not show, just showing up isn't enough. You can't show up and be boring. Nobody is interested in that. You have to show up and you have to get them enthusiastic and get them in the game. You have to get people excited about your product and not make it a grueling task for it to be a buying decision. If you want more people to come into your industry, they can't just say, oh, well, it's a good salary and I guess it's stable. No, those people will phone it in. You want the best of the best. So you need to actually get them excited about these things. And if you're not excited, you can't sell it. You can't sell something that you don't believe in. I mean, I guess you can, but I mean, I'm not gonna buy it from you. Um, so you have to think about those things. You have to be able to articulate your core values. You have to think about intentionally. What is it I want people to say about me and my brand? What is the story? Do I want to be someone who is known for honoring their debts, good or bad? You know, do I want to be known as someone who is a, a person of integrity, a person of their word? Do I want to be known as somebody who performs well? Do I want to be known as someone who maybe is the fastest person at this particular skill set or the person who has the highest versatility? Whatever it is you want to authentically demonstrate, your content and the volume of your content, the range of your body of work says that. And if you're gonna do it, doing it in the second largest search engine in the world is probably not a bad thing. So I want you to ask yourself these things when you're putting your personal brand into context so that it informs the intentionality behind your executions. So creating great content is about building a body of work that represents you. What is it that you want represented about you? What is it that you want people to know you for? How do you want to be thought of? What do you want the story around the water cooler or when you're not in the room? What do you want people saying? 
and you have to build a body of work that facilitates that. I want to be known as a creative entrepreneur that helps other creative individuals. So I built my brand around that. I built my brand by demonstrating what skills I have and talking about my own experiences and answering questions for people. I went directly to my community and I started answering their questions so they know I'm a facilitator that I'm there to help them, not just talk about whatever I want to talk about. So I made it inclusive. I brought them to the table and then I made myself a resource. And in that regard, I would become indispensable to those people. In the context of your personal brand and your career or your industry, you can become indispensable by solving other people's problems and also demonstrating your authority and credibility. And again, even if you're not the best, you might be the most accessible. And that is a value to people. Sometimes people don't want the best. Sometimes people want what is affordable to them. Sometimes people want the fastest because they have a sense of urgency. Sometimes they want the thing that has the lowest barrier to entry because they're intimidated. So you have to understand your audience and understand the value that they consider to be authoritative. And you have to understand that maybe there's nobody in this niche that is as accessible or is present or is showing up or making the information digestible, something that anyone, whether they're entry level, can understand. Or for those people who, okay, there's only entry level information, be the person who then provides the advanced information or gives context to something. Or maybe somebody who, Lord forbid, eliminates the jargon in your industry or clarifies it. You know, a lot of people try very hard to be clever. I'm a fan of the fact that I think clarity trumps being clever like every time. I think being easily understood and clearly communicating something, especially what your value proposition is, is much more important than trying to be clever or be fancy. So in order to build credibility and authority in your niche, it's important to understand the no like, and trust factor. If you're not present somewhere, if people have no idea who you are, if they don't know your name, how are they supposed to trust you? That's why showing up and building content matters because if you're solving a problem for them, if you're creating context for them, then they have an opportunity to say, okay, I had a great experience with that person. I like what I got because you showed up. And then over time and over frequency, that trust is there and you become the authoritative source of information for them, the go-to. There's someone in your circle. In fact, I actually want a show of hands for this one. Has anyone here for a friend, family member, or colleague influenced a buying decision in the last 30 days? Show of hands. I want you guys to keep those hands up. Now look around. Every single one of you has influenced, for the most part, a buying decision of someone in your inner circle. Guess what? That's what an influencer is. It's not trite to say that everyone is an influencer. We all influence buying decisions. I buy craftsman tools to this day because my dad did. If it was good enough for dad, it's good enough for me. So I'm a craftsman guy now. So you build that through showing up and creating that no like, and trust factor. Overall body of work, your overall body of work, what represents you, the amount of that that is quality, all of that is important in building that no and like, trust factor. Because if you knock it out of the park for somebody once, well that's one thing, that could be a fluke. But if you're constantly showing up, if you're consistent, and you're always there and you're reliable as a source of information and you're giving good information, you're getting it right, or you're again, the person that is the most accessible or the most enthusiastic, that's going to resonate with people. That's going to matter to them. I also believe in building a superior visual brand. When I show up and I do these slides, I make my slides unique and I try to use my background as a graphic designer to kind of, well, make them better than everybody else's. Um, so when you show up in your niche, being the person who has the best looking thumbnail, the best looking channel artwork, the best logo, the best photography, that sets you apart, which means that if you're the outlier, if you're the newcomer, and it says, oh, well, everything's saturated. If it's saturated by 80% of things that look like crap, but it was the only thing available, guess what? Just by showing up and looking better, you win because everything else will now, by comparison, look like the person wasn't even trying, no matter how good they thought they were. We always are satisfied until an alternative shows up. Just ask Blockbuster. So you can completely ignore saturation as far as I'm concerned. The answer is that yes, the market is saturated with crap. You know, your competitors, just be better than them. Just even 5% better is enough to change a person's buying decision or be more accessible or be more likable. Be something that resonates with the uh, quality that the person wants because they'll decide what quality is. What people say about you when you're not there. What do people, what do you want them to say? Do you want them to say, you know what? At the end of the day, 
That was the person who finally made it clear for you, finally made it click. Everybody had been saying this thing over and over and this was the person who made it click. Or you know what? So-and-so actually paid individual attention to me. They actually focused in on me and treated me like a human being and made me feel special. That's what you want to resonate with people. And you know what happens when you do that? It's when you actually reply and when they feel that they've been heard. The great thing about YouTube is it's not television. It is not only a content platform, it is an engagement platform. You have the ability to not only aggregate all this great data to qualify ROI, have this great opportunity to reach people for free, but at the same time, you can actually hear the sentiment and feedback of how they engaged with it, what their experience is, and you have the opportunity to respond. You have the opportunity to respond and make sure those people feel heard and it can make the entire difference of their experience of the brand. Because if you are the only company, the only person that ever acknowledged what they said and what their pain was, and you come up with an empathetic response, even not solving the problem, but just having an empathetic response, that will mean something to them and it could change the entire relationship and the perception of your brand and make you stand out and make you superior in their mind and in their heart to all of your competitors. So now that we've gotten past that philosophical point, I wanna give you some straight up practicality. YouTube best practices. These are things that I've learned through the course of doing over 1,000 videos on YouTube that I produced, edited, shot, optimized, marketed, and distributed by myself. Which, by the way, I do not recommend doing that by yourself. Outsource as much of that as possible. Like, that's for crazy people like me who wanna do these ridiculous case studies. I, I don't recommend it. If you're thinking of doing all of that by yourself, ask your doctor first and maybe your therapist. So, learn the platform and its key features. One of the mistakes that both brands and individual content creators make is they never bother to study the platform and its key features. They never bother to fill in all the blanks. When a developer, when a developer makes a field and an about section or something that says keywords go here or what have you, the reality is this, that section wasn't put there arbitrarily. It was put there for a reason. And if people ignore that, then they can't complain when they don't get the full benefits of the platform if they're not using the key features of the platform. I know when all of you put the time and effort to do your work, you're not doing it arbitrarily. There's a method to the madness, there's a reason, and it usually matters. You're not putting something there for the sake of putting something there. And so when it gets ignored, well, that's a problem. And so I would say learn the key features of the platform. I know that that will take time, but a lot of people don't realize YouTube puts out some information about this, not only on their blog, but in the actual help sections. They've even created a separate YouTube channel that is literally just a video based version of their help section, which by the way, is a great content idea for all of you. Building a video library that answers all the FAQs and all the problems that a consumer might have, any questions that you get that are in the FAQs, add that to them and then also make a video library for people to be able to get that information. Saves your customer service folks a lot of time. They can point them to something that answers the question instead of repetitively doing the same thing. We'll get to that in the content strategy section in a bit. But figure that part out. Focus on something specific. Earlier, someone was talking about selling cars and selling shoes. A lot of people try to do too many things on one channel instead of getting very specific and micro-focused. It is very difficult and challenging to sell both cars and sneakers, uh, and I wouldn't recommend trying to do that. In the context of YouTube, you have a lot of people that try to build out a library of content that's very confusing and lacks any definitive relationship. And that is actually a problem, and it can actually really damage their brand and create brand confusion for the consumer. So, you want to focus on a very specific niche or genre or a very specific problem that you're solving when you go to this platform. You also want to study other brands and creators that are in your niche and see what the standard is. You don't want to copy them, but you want to get a sense of what the normal is in the marketplace from the perspective of the consumer. What are they used to seeing? And it's not about you only adhering to that standard. It's about you realizing that there might be an opportunity to raise the bar. There may be an opportunity to be disruptive here because if everybody is doing the same thing, well now that's where things get interesting because you can bring something new and exciting to the table and that can wake people up. 
and it will help you to stand out if there's already saturation. That's how you break through. Saturation is never something to worry about regardless of the platform. It's just a matter of having a very intentional strategy to break through and realizing that there's a human being on the other end of the engagement. These vanity metrics that we use to measure ROI, I think sometimes we may take for granted that that's a real human being. And what's gonna resonate with you as a real human being if you're similar to the target market that you're after? You have to think about, well, what would do it for me? What's my experience like? Mapping your own overall experience in YouTube and looking at your own user behavior, which by the way, the algorithm's already doing that. If you wanted to figure out and understand the YouTube algorithm or any platform algorithm, I would challenge you to be a real user, a real consumer of that platform for 100 days. And for 100 days, journal your actual user behavior and what's happening as you do that and what the platform is delivering to you. And all of a sudden you have the black box because artificial intelligence is just trying to be a pale imitation of a human being at scale anyway. So if you map your own user behavior and figure out what it did in response to what you did, you start to get the corners of that puzzle filled out. So I would recommend that. We talked about having um, a strong visual brand. I think that goes without saying. I would imagine that the far majority of you understand the importance of that. I mean, look at how wonderful Name Summit has done with their uh, visual branding so far. In fact, just real quick, for Name Summit doing uh, such a great job on the first year of their event, I want to interrupt this to just give them a round of applause if you guys don't mind. <laughs> Absolutely. Just understand, shout outs don't work in YouTube anymore. <laughs> so, build a strong visual brand. Have a goal beyond YouTube. I think that goes without saying for this audience that you, none of you want to be on a platform just to be on a platform. You have a goal. That goal might be ROI in the form of revenue. It might be ROI in the idea of brand awareness, the fact that you might want to use this to offset your PPC ad buys because you realize that this could have massive organic reach for you and also the SEO factor. You might want to use this uh, for data collection because what a lot of people take for granted is that the, Google, the YouTube analytics, YouTube's owned by Google. Google's the first largest search engine in the world. They have one of the most ro robust analytics platform. In my opinion, in some ways, the YouTube analytics under the dashboard, in some ways contextually are superior to Google Analytics in terms of the usability of that data, the actionable stuff that's there. Um, I love that part of it, and I think it gets underestimated by brands that you can use YouTube and what resonates with an audience for data collection to understand what there's a demand for, what there's sentiment for, what people are searching for, because instead of searching, going to your website and having a bounce rate where the average bounce rate ends up being under a minute, under 30 seconds, something like that, the bounce rate on YouTube videos as far as average viewer duration watch time is close to two minutes closer to two minutes of engagement, dwarfing the time people spend on websites. Why? Because video is lean in engagement content. It's nowhere near as passive. So understanding that aspect of it is very important and mapping those things to your goals beyond YouTube in terms of is the goal of this particular video is the call to action to introduce a concept that solves a problem and then drive them to a freebie. And I'll get to this in the content portion, but you could take a lead magnet you already have for your mailing list, convey some of the information or tease out some of the information of the problem that lead magnet would solve for somebody, introduce that lead magnet as a download in the description of your YouTube video, and you can use the reach of an organic YouTube video that is evergreen in nature for search and sits in your YouTube ecosystem forever to keep funneling passive leads to your email list and drive more downloads. That is a content strategy hack that we will get to, but I just wanted to tease that out right here that you could use YouTube specifically for the purpose of growing your email list. An example of that is I jumped about 800 new subscribers to my email list with one video in YouTube in a 48 hour period. In a 48 hour period. And that was one video. You could put a strategy in place where if you're putting out um, a volume of three or five videos a week to maybe one video every week is repurposing some of your existing lead magnets and adding some context to them in the form of video to drive more downloads. Because if they decide to opt in to a video that they wanna watch for five minutes, 
getting a freebie out of that, that's an easy and low threshold of anxiety for them. And if you've built the trust and credibility in delivering a good video that, that was worth watching, they'll trust you to deliver good content in the form of whatever your free download is for the email. So that's again, down to no like and trust factor. Learning YouTube SEO and discovery strategy. A lot of people have talked about the nature of SEO changing and they're absolutely right about it. You can't just do keyword stuffing. However, the way the YouTube algorithm works with machine learning is it's using that for the placement of relevancy. And for those of you who want to monetize online content, it's using it for relevancy of ad placement and ad distribution as well. And how much of the ad inventory is available to your type of content and your type of audience. So, in YouTube, do not ignore the keyword tags, but use them properly. If you want a great tool for using the keywords in YouTube properly and thinking about search and discovery, I recommend uh, TubeBuddy. If you wanna to go to tubebuddy.com slash awesome, that is one of the best tools and they're YouTube certified and almost all the leading YouTube marketers are leveraging this tool. Uh, for those of you who want it, I do have a 20% discount code you can use for that. Uh, just put in Roberto's Buddy, all lowercase, no apostrophe, and you'll get 20% off of TubeBuddy. And the reason I bring it up is it's my secret weapon. I use that with my instincts and background in uh, web design and SEO to augment a video that in its first 48 hours only got 3,000 views in six months, only accumulated through search about 40,000 more views, which wasn't bad at all. But I optimized this with TubeBuddy and then over the course of another six months, that video is up to over 900,000 views. So the impact that this had in terms of optimization and discoverability and relating this content to other videos that could promote it, because that's the other beauty of YouTube is that when you make content, it does stand on its own, but not entirely. It also can be recommended by other content based on those users' behavior, their preferences, and what they watched. The YouTube algorithm it uses keywords and metadata and titles and descriptions for relevancy, but after that, it's about user behavior in the form of search history and watch history. These are the two tokens that the YouTube algorithm sets in order to determine user patterns and behavior and then find similar like-minded users with similar patterns and distribute your content to them based on what they watched. So your video is relating to other videos and understanding those tactics and how YouTube SEO and discovery works is the secret to your evergreen content making a larger impact over time for your business and your brand. So kind of an important thing to know. Know your unique value proposition. Know what you offer that nobody else in your niche is offering. For some of you, the people in your niche, none of them are going to YouTube or they're not focused on it or they're putting out one video a month just by showing up and dominating the search results page with the unique specific value that your consumers are looking for. You can educate them more, you can build more excitement around your brand. There's just so much opportunity and you can disrupt all of that. Produce consistent quality content. Engage with your audience. Actually have a business plan for your YouTube channel. Is your YouTube channel there to grow your email list? Is it there to grow awareness of your brand? Is your YouTube channel there for you to make uh, monetization through the ad revenue? Is it there to drive more traffic to your website? Is it there to promote or sell your product or service? Is it there for you for lead generation for clients? Have an actual strategy and actually have a business plan associated with your YouTube channel or incorporate it to your existing business plan and use it not only in the context of social media but as a true content platform. Ask yourself right now if you could be on either regional or nationally syndicated television for free would you do it? Probably. You'd figure it out. Even if you don't have a plan for what you do for it now, the answer would be yes. I would show up. I would be there in a heartbeat. I'll make the deal. I'll figure out the show later. I'll figure it out later. Just give me the airtime, right? And so YouTube is that opportunity. If you trust the Wall Street Journal as a source, they already said that YouTube is getting more watch time than television right now. There's no quote unquote mainstream media, it would be old media because in the context of the definition of reach and engagement, Snapchat, YouTube, all these things have supplanted radio and publishing in terms of print and in many cases television already just by the numbers and by the data. It's just that we haven't gotten to the colloquialism of differentiating that and not saying that, oh, this is mainstream media versus this is mainstream media. So I use the nuance of old versus new for now, but that's on a timer because <laughs> that will change. 
That's the only real constant we have in all of digital media marketing and everyone here is most likely an online services professional. We have nothing but chaos to, live, to look forward to. But that's okay because for the, my Game of Thrones fans out there, you already know chaos is a ladder. So visual branding. This is something I talked about. I invested into my visual brand because I'm a graphic designer and photographer and illustrator and I know the value of that. And as a marketer and someone who came from the world of billboards and OOH, I also know that it does have an impact and it's an experience unto itself. It is different. And so I commissioned an artist, Joshua Pomeroy, to make mini Roberto and that has been a good part of my brand that separates me from other people. And when the context of YouTube, you have to have channel artwork you have your thumbnails. The channel artwork is the banner, just like your website banner, just like your social media headers in Facebook and Twitter. Thumbnails are the individual, let's say billboards or book covers for context. They are the front facing portion of your content. If you think of it in retail terms, thumbnails are the packaging for every piece of content that you're gonna deliver on. And ultimately, titles and thumbnails are what drive clicks and click-throughs. You can think of that partly in the context of banner advertisements. If something was going to get someone's attention and stand out in YouTube, it has to have a fantastic thumbnail. If you think of it as billboards, something that has to pass the 60 mile per hour test of, hmm, can I get context in this when I'm driving down the road at 60 miles per hour? Well, consider that with a YouTube homepage or a YouTube search page, you have all these things competing for your attention. What stands out in there? Your thumbnail, is the photography good? Is the typography good? Is there a good design? Is it using a border? Does it have something that is letting it be unique out of everything there and is it screaming off of all of that white space? Because if it's not and it's flat or it's lazy or you just took a still out of the video or you didn't do it intentionally, how can you have the expectation of a click? How can you have the expectation of someone taking time out of their day, five minutes, 10 minutes, that they could be spending getting more work done or that they can be spending with their spouse or their children, how can you feel entitled to that five or 10 minutes for your content if you only wanted to put 30 seconds into the packaging? So you have to be intentional there. The YouTube profile picture. The YouTube profile picture gives context. If you're a personal brand, it should be a photo and not a logo. If you're a company, maybe it's a photo in the profile pic that gives some context to your brand and what you do. If you do have a prominent or a well-designed logo, then maybe it should be that but you also have to consider the design of the platform itself. YouTube is using Google's material design. That means there's a lot of white space there. So making sure that you have something that stands out against that white space is gonna be important. And you can learn aesthetic lessons in branding from great companies like Apple and Samsung and even Microsoft when it comes to how to stand out in this because they've had to invest in this in their own social media. So there's a lot of reference points. Motion graphics, you can have lower thirds, you can have things that fly out and give context. If you're going to do talking head informational videos, which is what most of my content does, a simple lower third across the bottom, a simple show don't tell, cut to some B-roll or pop up a word on the screen as you're talking, goes a long way to keeping people excited and enthused and not feeling like they're getting bored or things are getting stiff. Kind of like me bouncing around this stage and everything being a little bit more animated instead of static. So that becomes important. Video style and color. Video style and color makes you unique. It means that your aesthetic is different. Everyone here knows when they see a J.J. Abrams film because even if his name was on screen, it's like, ah, here are the lens flares. You would know it. You could probably, I could take any couple of seconds from a Tarantino film without you even recognizing the actors or actresses and you would understand and know the style of a Quentin Tarantino film. So having your own visual style really does matter. This could be a matter of the angles, the photography, the lighting, the color grading. You can figure this out. YouTube end cards. At the end of a YouTube video, you have the opportunity to promote something. This could be uh, your website. This could be your subscribe button. This could be another video that keeps people on the platform longer, which by the way, keeping people on the platform longer favors you in the algorithm. YouTube, much like Google, is about session starts and session ends and the length of an overall engagement. So keep that in mind. End cards are a strategy they came up with where people have this interactive element that also works on mobile devices that allows you to promote the next video in your library. And you can make these as interactive and unique as you want. The YouTube watermark. Everyone here is probably familiar with watermarks being a graphic symbol that sits in the corner that might be your logo or do something to give context. YouTube has this and the action associated with clicking that watermark in the corner, if you brand it, is that people will then be able to subscribe to your channel if they haven't already. And so you can design this. A lot of people 
put the word subscribe as their watermark to drive that as a call to action within the video as an interactive element. Some people will put their face, some people put their signature because that adds to the aesthetic of this thing. So you can utilize that as something to stand out and be interesting. And finally, the YouTube channel layout itself. Organizing your channel with playlists and series and well-designed thumbnails and organizing how that looks just like you would if you were an e-commerce store, you would have the products lined up in a way that makes sense, contextualizes them, almost like aisles in a grocery store. That's what you want to do with your YouTube channel layout. Great example of this is what I did here. I have multiple things on my channel that help creative professionals and sometimes that is uh, interesting things regarding the camera equipment that I use and in other cases it's actual tutorials on various types of software that you can use in your branding and your marketing or the execution of your day to day work. And so I actually made that very clear. I put a title and a description in each of those featured playlists to give them context and then you have the individual videos. You can also see there that I choose to close caption my videos, not everyone does. I pay a company called Rev.com, uh, hashtag not sponsored, FCC if you're watching that's not sponsored. Um, the, uh, I pay Rev.com a dollar per minute for transcriptions so that's closed caption. Why? More metadata for the search engine and then the altruistic part of me that has done the data dump to see that oh wait, about 55% of my audience exists outside of the US, about 40% are outside of the US, Canada and the UK. Wait a minute, let me go ahead if those people aren't necessarily native English speakers but can read English, let me go ahead and do closed captioning so that they engage with my content more. So understanding your user base and then doing things that work for that is actually extraordinarily practical. And then in terms of visual aesthetic, making things clear, making things organized, that matters. In the design of my thumbnails and the visual aesthetic there, I went for clarity. I went for clarity, I went with strong design, with strong branding, and also an emotional connection. So I have a picture of me smiling, I have a um, cartoon character that has a big smile, and then it's creating context in terms of we're talking about passive income. This is the highest performing video on my channel with almost 1 million views and it was done just a year ago. And again, first 48 hours, that video only got 3,000 views. It did not go viral, it got these accumulated views over time. And from a monetization standpoint, that video still ironically generates hundreds of dollars of passive income a month. So that's one of the ironies of it. But the design aesthetic of this was done with the billboard strategy. Everyone in the back, you can clearly read what the main title of that is, right? So that actually is important in terms of thinking about the design. The other thing I did is I made this different than everyone who had a video about making money online or passive income um, that was in the search result page because almost every single one of those videos when I did this was a channel that had hundreds of thousands of subscribers and had tens of thousands of views. I beat them all for the number one search based on relevancy, but part of that was also user engagement. I made the most clickable thumbnail out of everybody who was already saturated in that topic. I made the most clickable thumbnail that would be on the first page so that it was front and center in the grocery aisle to end up in the cart. And so it's just merchandising and packaging. It's literally retail 101, and you can take that same knowledge of e-commerce and retail to the YouTube platform and win. So strategy, strategy is the game. Ultimately, there are five major secrets to being successful in YouTube, and I put that in the context of business because with a quarter million subscribers, I'm only the roughly 20,000 biggest YouTuber out of 15 million. There are people with infinitely larger uh, audiences than me. I've been doing this since the summer of 2013. There are people who are much more established in this niche than me. So how did I do that? It wasn't overnight success. I never went viral and that's never been my intention. I went to YouTube to build my personal brand. I went to YouTube to build my consultancy as a creative services professional. I went to YouTube to help other creatives not become starving artists. I went there because I felt I had value to give to other people who were like-minded and had similar experiences or aspired to. And those were my goals while also monetizing clearly. And every one of my videos has been mapped to those intentions and that specific value. Understanding your audience and what they want from you is the key to success no matter what. 
There are people who have no understanding of the YouTube algorithm from a technical level, but what they do understand is they paid attention to the first 100 people to watch them. They paid attention to the next 1,000 people to watch them. They paid attention and looked at what the behavior was of those other 10,000 people. And then that's how they got to millions, is because they did real customer service in the context of content. They didn't think of their content as just a marketing or advertising play. They looked at it as a service. They looked at each individual as a person, and they looked at the group in aggregate and figured out what it was that was desirable that they were offering, and they tripled down, and they pivoted when appropriate. If you can do that, you can succeed not only in YouTube, but in any social media or content platform if you understand what your audience is, if you understand the demand, if you just understand the emotional value and the rational intellectual value that they place on things, you can position against that and win. Larger creators and larger brands in YouTube, they do have an initial advantage. They have the advantage of they've had their audience longer, their audience is engaged with them, their audience will respond to anything that they put out. And a lot of people get discouraged by that because of what we talked about with saturation. But here's the thing, unlimited opportunity. You know who had a competitive advantage in the marketplace and now gets to forever be the butt of every single one of my jokes when I get on stage? Blockbuster. Blockbuster had a chain. Blockbuster had hundreds of stores. They had notoriety. They had 30 years of name and reputation. And where are they now? Disruption is always available. Nobody is safe. Nobody is ever safe. If there's anything we've learned from Game of Thrones, the best show on cable, hashtag not sponsored, um, then it's that, that nobody is safe. So you can show up, bring something new to the marketplace, and you can disrupt them. Because YouTube, while there are advantages for larger creators because they've already been there, just like anyone else who has experience, that doesn't mean that outliers and new people can't come to the table, offer value that hasn't been there before, or reach an underrepresented or underserved audience. Again, there might be people in your niche who are doing something, but they might not be doing it well, or they may not be showing up as much as you, or the quality might not be there, or the emotional connection might be lacking. You can come in and be disruptive. And for all you know, there might only be five competitors in your niche in YouTube, and they might all suck. Guess what, show up and be better than them. That's the answer. If there's 500, great, maybe 400 of them suck. You only have 100 people to knock off the top of the mountain. So just take the Iron Throne. It's not that hard. It only takes about eight seasons. And a few dragons. And a few dragons. So um, I would say there's unlimited opportunity because since it's about machine learning, since it's about user behavior, and since you can't just keyword stuff, you can't just clickbait, and since the age of um, YouTube reply girls is over, thank God, well, guess what? You have the opportunity, if you show up and you are what's in demand, you can win. So you have unlimited opportunity here. You can also use other platforms to grow your channel. If you have other social media platforms, you can use them as distribution for your existing content. You can also use them to um, elevate the awareness that you have a YouTube channel in the first place. For you know, tactical purposes, I would say that using Twitter and finding hashtags associated with your industry. You know what? Um, I would say that uh, for a lot of people here, if you use the hashtag marketing problems, if you use the hashtag brand fail and you look at what's going on there, you'll see people complaining, you'll see people have a pain point. You can use that data to say, hmm, I might have content that can solve that problem. Let me engage in this conversation. Let me not go ahead and put my link in there just yet. Let me go ahead and send a few personalized tweets to people asking if they've tried this, troubleshoot for them a little bit. It takes seconds and then right after that, you can go ahead and address the pain point of that hashtag and that thread with a piece of content you've already created or if you haven't yet, you can say, okay, in real time, I know that in this moment, in this week, there are people experiencing this particular problem. I can go ahead and I can make a video that helps illustrate why my brand or my company or why I have the answer to that and I can help those people and that will give me authority with them and those people are representative of the other thousands of people who have that same problem and now I have this evergreen piece of content that will be there. And that's just using Twitter. Obviously, there are other things you can do. You can have Facebook groups and you can share this appropriately there. You can do distribution. Now, I know that Facebook suppresses links. Um, I will get to a distribution hack for that a little later in the presentation, so stay tuned. Um, watch time. Watch time matters more than views or subscribers. We talked about machine learning. We talked about the algorithm. Watch time, in the context of this audience, I want to say that's similar to the phrase time on site. Anyone here familiar with Google Analytics and the phrase time on site? Show of hands. 
All right, quite a few of you. All right, so watch time matters to people more than views or subscribers because watch time is an indicator of true user engagement. The only currency that any of us really truly should value at the end of the day is time because we have a finite and unknown amount of it. And that's a very real thing. So when someone offers you your, their time, they're much more likely to offer you their money as well because one of those things is replaceable and the other isn't. So if you can get a certain amount of investment of someone's time, it's going to be easier to convert them, which is why we know about touch points in the sales cycle. It's why we have drip campaigns. It's why we want direct access to people through email marketing. Well, you can contextualize that in YouTube by saying that if I can absorb a certain amount of people's attention at scale and in aggregate as a group, as a whole, that means that I truly am authoritative with them. And YouTube looks more at the watch time that people spend on a channel and on individual videos to decide whether this thing is authoritative and then uses titles, descriptions, and tags to match that against relevancy to see who that matters to and who that's authoritative to and what else is similar to that. And that's how it ultimately promotes and ranks and distributes content. So if you really want to understand what the main variable of success in YouTube is beyond the philosophical component of understanding your audience, it's understanding your audience with the goal of increasing watch time and session starts, making your content the thing that puts more people on YouTube.com. They want more people on YouTube.com. If your content can accomplish that, your content will be promoted. If your content keeps people on YouTube.com, even if it's not on your videos, but on another related video from another creator, then guess what? Your competition can give you authority. Your competition can actually elevate you. A high tide raises all ships. That's the other great thing about this platform and about the fact that the saturation is irrelevant. The saturation can actually benefit you if you're better. So with that, the last thing I want to say is a major secret is the titles and thumbnails. No matter what, it's more important than people realize because even if you rank in the algorithm, even if you can get on everybody's homepage, even if you can be in everyone's inbox, well, what then? Plenty of you here, everyone here has an email list, right? For the love of God, please tell me you have an email list. Show of hands. All right, great. Anyone here with an email list that has better than 10% open rate? Show of hands. Me too, 20%? Just us lucky few. So you see how even if you had massive reach, if you can't get people to take the next step, the next action, it's irrelevant. So what entices them? A title that says, this is relevant to me, or entices them through curiosity or something being emotionally satisfied. A thumbnail that says, this is relevant to me, or this triggers my curiosity, piques my interest, or is going to have an emotionally satisfying result, at least in theory. And if it doesn't have an emotionally satisfying result, well, I'll let you know in the comment section, probably like in a very uh, specific way, a very aggressive way. So types of content on YouTube. We've talked about knowing and understanding your audience. We've talked about facilitating demand. Let's talk more about the actual content you need to make. There are three types of main content on YouTube and the slashes that I have there contextualize what their value is. Help content in the form of how-tos, tutorials, definitions, what is, explainer videos, so on and so forth, is search-friendly content that is usually evergreen in nature. Hub content and community content is for the people who've already said yes to you. It's something to keep people who are already with you coming back once they've discovered you. Well, how do you retain them? That's what community and hub content is. It's basically the idea of this is the acquisition of new customers, this is the retention of those customers and hero content has viral potential, that is essentially your Super Bowl ad. So you have help, hub, and hero, the three H's. And by the way, that's something that YouTube themselves talks about. In my discussions with people who work at YouTube, they say that balancing this in your content strategy is the secret. You have to determine what the appropriate ratio for your personal brand or your business or your company is of this. Many technical people, much like myself, will go very heavy on search content. I have yet to make any hero content. That's a plan that I have going into next quarter because I haven't needed to go viral to accomplish my goals. But it never really hurts unless it does. Um, usually when you go viral, it's not for the reasons you want. <laughs> As far as hub content, community content, well, this is about humanizing yourself or your brand. Uh, in the case of personal brands, 
This is what's known as vlogging usually. Anyone here familiar with the term vlogging? Vlogging is video logging. What was blogging? Blogging was just a public version of journaling. It was talking about what's interesting to you, what matters to you, or sharing your experience or your journey. Whoops, we're not there yet. Um, so the reason that vlogging can be valuable to you as a personal brand, even as a company, is that we relate to individuals. And if individuals are representative of us, it's easier to make that connection and that's gonna help influence our buying decision more. As I said, my um, understanding and relationship and the credibility my father had with me made me a Craftsman Tools person. It has influenced my buying decisions my entire adult life when it comes to tools. And that's because that's something that's relatable and it's something where I consider his information to be valuable and trustworthy, unlike his information about Santa. So, you know, that kind of matters. Do you have the authority and credibility and the trust there? And now that I understand you intellectually, well, what about emotionally? Because even if I intellectually understand something, the commitment is gonna come from an emotional place. It's gonna come from your gut. The more familiarity you have with someone outside the context of their intellectual value, the easier it's gonna to be to get past their gut reactions or skepticism. So that could be important in humanizing your brand. It's why we love these stories where we see what it's like to really work at a place. It's why we love these stories when we have true customer testimonials and we hear about how this one change or this one thing saves someone's business from ruin. We love that because it's a very human struggle and because we can identify with the fear and pain of those people and the relief that they have in the results that were produced for them. So that actually does matter. And obviously with the value of hero content, well, that virality, that ability for something to be shared over and over again, for that thing to be a headline, for that thing to be newsworthy, that's obviously valuable because it gives you attention. But if you go there first and get attention with nothing of substance, and then nothing to retain people, it's ultimately worthless because you got all this attention and you have nothing to do with it. You have nowhere, you have all these people, and then, well, what now? You're a one hit wonder. But if you have an inventory of helpful things for them, and then they're also able to connect and resonate with you, you can retain them in the long run. And that's ultimately what you want. So balancing this appropriately in the context of your brand and your business is what's gonna really matter for you. Create awesome content. I didn't just come up with the phrase create awesome and the company create awesome media out of nowhere. I ultimately had a definitive vision for what I wanted to do with my life. I wanted to wake up every day, create awesome things and share them with the world and teach other people how to do that. If you have something of, that you have a skill, if you have something that you have a passion and a desire for, if you've done something that you think matters, if you have a journey that you think is important to put out there, you on some level have an obligation to share that with the world, to inspire others, or to give other people education or resources to enable them and allow them to take action. It is my goal and my desire that all of you are more successful in your businesses because again, a high tide raises all ships. So I want you to be able to create great content that doesn't bore people, that doesn't suck, that converts for your business, or elevates your credibility and your authority and I want you to be able to do it from an authentic place that you're excited about each and every day because with the finite time that every human being has no one deserves to have their time wasted and no one deserves for themselves to squander their content or their potential or their time so ultimately it's about creating value it's about creating something awesome each and every day by being consistent by being authentic and by showing up and doing hundred percent whether it's for 200 people or 200,000 people or just two. It matters, it is important. And when you do that, people recognize it. It's how when everyone starts at zero, they end up with a following in an audience. It's because they showed up and they delivered and it mattered to someone. It might have changed someone's life, someone's career, someone's business. It might have got them to go on another day. It might have been the pivotal information that no one in their life and in their inner circle was ever able to articulate to them in a way that mattered. So. In that regard, we're talking about quality content. What is quality content? There are two types of quality. Let's start with objective quality. In the context of video and YouTube, objective quality is about visual quality and aesthetic. That means is a video sharp? Is it in focus? Is it lit well? That is all important. Audio quality. Nothing disrupts an experience of video worse than poor audio. Has anyone here ever watched a video online and the audio was horrible and you clicked off immediately? Show of hands. Exactly, it's the worst thing. We can forgive grainy video, bad lighting, bad editing. We can forgive all of that if the audio experience is somewhat decent. 
Editing quality matters because it's about communicating and telling a story. It's about creating context. There are things where something might drag on way too long and then that makes us disinterested and we leave. So when you want to measure the quality of a video, if you want to say, how do I know if my video is good? You can start with the objective measurements of quality in terms of its visual quality and aesthetic, its audio quality as an experience that may be distracting or not, and then whether the editing allows us to stay engaged or not, and whether it communicates something clearly. But you could do all of that and still fail because of subjective quality. So this is the other part of it. Is this emotionally resonating and satisfying with the viewer? Is this interesting to me or is it boring? Click away. Is this relevant to me specifically? This might be interesting, it might be good, but it does nothing for me. It solves no problem for me and, oh, well, that's not my situation. Click away. Is this engaging? Uh, you know what, this is good information and it does pertain to what I'm going on, but you know what, I just am not feeling it. It's not hitting me. It's not making me feel great. So click away. You have to accomplish all of these things. You have to be interesting. You have to get my attention. It has to be, oh wow, that looks interesting. That looks fun. You have to be relevant. Oh, that looked interesting. But you know what? On second thought, it doesn't matter. It's not important to me specifically. That's for somebody else. Maybe I click away, but I might share it. That might be for cousin Marty or something. I don't know. So, you know, you have to consider that. And then is it engaging? Does this get me to act? Does this get me to say, okay, that was good. But is it good enough to convince me to buy something? Was your review of this camera, this drone, good enough to make me say, you know what? I want to go to BH Photo Video. I want to go to Amazon, hashtag not sponsored, um, to go out and buy that thing. Do I want to commit my wallet to that thing? And again, if I committed some time, I at least was interested. If I replied and I had a comment or a question and I got a response back that eased my anxiety, then maybe I'll commit to that. So again, this is what's make or break for you. You could actually fail on objective quality, and if you win on subjective quality, you might actually be fine and be able to get someone to commit to an action. But if you fail on subjective quality, no matter how good your objective quality was, it won't move the needle for you. The best answer is obviously to win at both, to the best of your ability and a degree. But what you think is great because of the objective quality of it and what you think is great because maybe for you it meets all these standards, you have to appreciate and understand that that might not pass the test with every single consumer. And that's okay. But you can use the data from YouTube to determine that and make the appropriate pivot. Every new video is an opportunity and no video is an actual failure. It's just a data point that you can use to win at a later date. So it's a lesson. It's not a true failure. It's not a true flop. It's going to help your performance overall because you know what to avoid and it's valuable. So generating content ideas. Anyone here ever use a content platform or social media and struggle with what do I do now? What do I make? What do I put out there? What's going to work? Show of hands. That is probably one of the things that causes most people and most businesses anxiety. But the thing is, if you're in a business, you're in luck because it's very straightforward for you getting started. There's this great line from a movie um, that I've watched, um, and I watch it like every year, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. You know what? If they're on the lot, they want to buy. Coffee is for closers only. Like, I love that because it's very real to me. If they're on the lot, they want to buy. If they're watching something, especially in the form of a how-to or a tutorial, they have an obvious pain point that they're looking to solve. And if they're going to spend time on it, the odds are they're willing to spend money on it, which means if they're on the lot, AKA if they're engaging with your content, then they want to buy. As someone who is in business, you have a list of 10 to 20 things that everyone who's ever bought from you has always asked that influenced their buying decision. You could write all of that down and guess what? Each of those things is a new piece of content you can make to qualify a real buyer. So simple, it's so straightforward, but it's easily overlooked. You also have the opportunity to demonstrate your skills and abilities. What I did with my personal brand was I demonstrated my skills and abilities. I demonstrated my knowledge and experience, aka my expertise. And also I went to my community and I crowdsourced information. I asked them what they were struggling with, what they want to know, what were their pain points, what was something that they needed help with. And they told me because the offer of extending help where it's not been offered before from somebody that you maybe like or that you trust now 
that's valuable and it deepens that like and that trust that you have of them when they are offering you something of help to you for your current situation and they offer it again and again you trust them more you reach out to them more and then when they ask you to make a commitment that's going to solve your problem at least in theory you feel that it's reliable so you can go ahead and you can actually crowdsource the answers for your content by saying well, what is it that you don't understand or what would help you feel more informed? You can educate your consumer base. And as I said, you can use social media platforms like Twitter, you can use polls, you can use Facebook groups, and then you can aggregate all of that for content ideas that you can generate because you will know what your audience, what your consumers, what your viewers really want from you. You just have to ask. Don't ask, don't get. So that is going to help you with content. You also can document a process. You can go ahead and you can reveal what the process is for working with you so that people have no mistake and they have clarity. And that's actually gonna save you time in the long run. If all of your uh, consumers, if all of your potential leads, all of your clients know what the process for starting the relationship is, and they've seen that, or they know what the prep work is that they have to do in order to be successful in working with you, that is going to ultimately lead to you having more people that you want, that you love working with, and that are not wasting your time. And they're not wasting their time either because they know that they're prepared for this. So you can really use this to educate your audience. And then finally, you can share a personalized experience. Remember, people work with people that they know, they work with people that they trust, they work with people they have an affinity with, that they feel that there's a kinship there, that there's a bond. And if you can create that by sharing a personal experience, even in a professional context, it goes a long way. So again, there is a value to a certain level of vulnerability and openness. Content strategy. In terms of executing this, once you know what content you need to make, you need to have a very clear and straightforward strategy. For most of you, you already probably have a content calendar for the other things you do. If you don't, I highly recommend it. It makes things simpler. It means you don't have to scramble. So I would say have a content calendar. In YouTube, if you really are worried about the algorithm, which I think in the context of business, you don't have to be as much, the new minimum for frequency of uploads is about three videos a week, which sounds like a lot. But you're talking to the madman here who by himself does the seven videos a week thing, if not more. And there's ways to get around that and ways to do that if you are doing it smart. And the way that I do it from a production standpoint is I do what's called batching. I do batch recording. I'm conveying information in small bites more often than not, usually about five to eight minutes to um, simplify something which means that to produce that in one take doing a talking head style video, to be in front of the camera, it means being in front of the camera for six to 10 minutes. So I set aside an hour and I produce about roughly a week's worth of content in one hour because I know exactly what I'm going to talk about. If I need to do bullet points, I do bullet points. I do no scripts. I just go cold because in my case, I'm just using my experience. I'm using something I already know. The only time that I make an exception is when I need technical specs so I don't get the information for a product wrong. If you need to use a teleprompter, use a teleprompter. If you need to use a script, use a script. But by batching and getting things out of the way, because again, if you go through the process of, I shoot a five minute video and it takes me 10 minutes. I then edit that video or have it edited and that takes 30 minutes to an hour. Oh, I then upload and optimize and do all this. To get one piece of content out, you've just done a two to three hour turnaround. That's impractical. But if you go ahead and you take the process and you break it down by chunks and say, you know what? We're going to do a production day and we're going to go ahead and film a bunch of content. And now we're going to do an editing day and we're going to set aside two hours or whatever to just do editing or three hours just do editing. And now we're going to upload all those things as private in YouTube and then we're going to set aside time to optimize those things and schedule them for a release. You know, it's a real practical process and I didn't have to come up with it myself. I just stole it from sitcoms and soap operas. I just stole it from television. They go ahead and they produce everything in advance and then just release it on a schedule. They shoot everything weeks, months, sometimes like almost half a year in advance. And then by the time we get it, that stuff already happened in their lives. They've already just been marketing and promoting it for the lead up. It's very practical. They don't produce this stuff in real time. Live broadcast obviously being the exception, which by the way, YouTube has a live broadcasting platform. Did anybody here know that? That you could do live streaming in YouTube? And you can also now do it from your mobile phone. And it's one of the best live streaming experience from the mobile phone. Really can't wait for the desktop version to kind of catch up to the mobile phone because that thing is a little bit tougher. But you can definitely take advantage of it. In the context of branding and business, 
You know how you could leverage that as a content strategy? Anybody here familiar with uh, doing webinars? Show of hands, okay, great. With YouTube, you could be doing webinars, making them non-exclusive webinars, scheduling them with a countdown, marketing them through Twitter and Facebook automatically, just automating that, send that out to your email list, because then that webinar and the free replay that will sit there on YouTube now becomes an aggregate lead funnel for you to go ahead and get people to go to a free download or a follow-up or to go ahead and buy from you. And all of a sudden, qualified leads, and now that means every follow-up, every email, every call is warm instead of cold. And it's at zero cost only time. And so that's a really good strategy. Do updates to that if it changes. If something changes, great. You're the person that is on top of the trend. You're the person who's on top of the change that is happening and you're keeping an audience informed and engaged and updated. So again, that is valuable in terms of a content strategy. You can also make branded miniseries. If you're struggling with, you know what, we can't put out content every single week and fight the algorithm on this and put out three pieces of content a week, Roberto, that's okay. I would rather you put out only 20 or 30 pieces of content for the entire year. You brand it as a series or you brand a few of those things. You make 25 videos, five video series of five videos a piece, 25, they solve specific problems or relate to specific products or services you offer and they qualify leads and provide value and have the appropriate calls to action. And then those 25 videos for the entire year put out all at once or in the course of a month or a few weeks on a release cycle ultimately benefits you more and I would just probably release each series all at once, one at a time, like you know, House of Cards, just dump the whole thing all five episodes for this one, then next month, all five episodes for this one, and so on and so forth, and set up your content calendar and your promotion cycle. And then all of a sudden, you benefit more from that than doing weekly uploads because this is evergreen in nature. It has a definitive beginning and end, and it's contextualizing the problem that your audience or your consumer has and giving them something where they understand what the commitment and investment is to solve it. Oh, it's these five videos that are five to 10 minutes a piece and they answer my five biggest pain points. Got it. That's the commitment to having the answer here. Oh, this aligns with exactly what I'm doing. So it's something packaged. It makes perfect sense. Um, and then again, this is nothing new. It's called P90X. It's called every Tybo workout DVD ever. That's all it is. It's the same thing, different platform, different user psychology, but the foundation is very much the same. Monetize your message. How many of you have been waiting for this one? The money part, right? No, it's all good, me too. So monetize your message. There are several methods of monetizing any video content platform, but YouTube in particular has a lot of strong things for it going for monetization. The obvious one being ad revenue. Now for those of you who are worried about, well, what if a competitor um, is advertising against my content? You can go into your AdSense account and you can actually put in the domain of your competitor and block them from doing ads. If there's a niche uh, that is specific to you, you could block the competitors in your niche. You can block certain things all and control that as the publisher. And some of you familiar with doing this from blogging uh, know this as well because you probably had that with your competitors putting banner advertisements on your website. So you're familiar with the fact that you can do this. It applies to YouTube as well. It's using those same platforms because it's another Google product. So advertising revenue, passive income through that, generating ads just like television that play before your content. And in some cases, if it's a 10 minute uh, piece of content, they play after as well. There's uh, banner placements as well as that. So these are ways that you make income. And the other one is obviously sponsorship. For you being a personal brand, if you have expertise, you can reach out to the brands that you use day to day in your business and you can get them to sponsor content. This can be in the form of mentions slash plugs, like this video brought to you by, you know, Name Summit. And so you can do that or it could be a product review or demonstration of the service or the item that they send you and you can uh, charge accordingly for that. That's something that I've done in the past as well. Affiliate programs is one of my favorites because you can go ahead and communicate something you use every day and that you already own to your audience and then use an affiliate program, whether it's Amazon or whether it's many of the domains and hosting companies that are here, many of them have affiliate marketing programs. And so if there's anyone in your audience that would benefit from that. That's extraordinarily lucrative. I think most of the domain companies here 
have uh, affiliate programs that pay out something like for the lowest plans, maybe like 50 to $100 for like the lowest monthly plan. And so that's a very practical thing for you to be able to monetize. Uh, it means that every view, regardless of how many views you get, is a potential uh, conversion there that's not insignificant, especially when we're talking about it being passive in nature. You also could go ahead and you could do your own products and services, which is the, probably the most practical thing you could do. You could do a membership group. I have a membership program that I started recently called Awesome Creator Academy. And you can go ahead and you can link out to your membership program because if you have qualified information or you're building a community, there are people who might want another level of access and you can give them exclusive content or free downloads or more access to you or private live streams. Whatever it is you're trying to do or accomplish in terms of your personal brand or your company or what have you, there's ways to leverage that. Obviously, books, ebooks, and audiobooks are another factor if you have those associated with your brand, especially if you're an industry professional or a service professional. There's almost no barrier to entry anymore for you to get published. With Kindle and CreateSpace, you can even have your own book in a physical bookstore. And then audiobooks are, in my opinion, are the most lucrative out of this because the best thing about audiobooks is that we're buying back our time. That's all I listen to on the flights to these conferences is audiobooks and podcasts. So there's an opportunity there. You can obviously market and sell a service. I market my um, services as a consultant around content strategy and video marketing and YouTube SEO through the demonstration of me executing it in my own personal brand. And so that's valuable. You obviously, if you have digital downloads, this is an opportunity for you to practically be your own sponsor in your video. You can turn off ads if you want to. You can turn down sponsorships and every video is sponsored by you. So, you know, this video brought to you by whatever I'm selling today. And, you know, that could be the answer. Online courses are very practical. And you could also do paid webinars and workshops. And then obviously, in my case, YouTube led to public speaking. So again, there are so many ways for you to monetize content. And again, it's not limited to YouTube. You could apply this in the context of other platforms for your personal brand, but these are just the ways that I've found that are the most straightforward in terms of converting and making money. Speaking of which, let's figure out how to make content that converts because, all right, great, Roberto, we can make money on YouTube, but will we? Well, that is the question. There is a certain amount of talent and emotional connection and things that go along with that, but more than anything, it goes back to the first thing I said, you have to understand your audience. So here's the types of content that ultimately convert the most in my experience, and not just me, but with other YouTubers that I talk to, other influencers that I talk to, and that I study and analyze. You have to create tremendous value. You have to build trust in order to convert because I'm not gonna buy from you if I don't know you and we don't have a relationship unless the product is phenomenal. And then I still have to believe and I have to trust that, and why would I? And there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Reviewing products and services. Being able to give honest and authentic reviews matters. Like I said, Craftsman Tools were good enough for dad. They're good enough for me. Hashtag, not sponsored by Craftsman Tools. Again, gotta worry about those regulations, right? Reveal a process or industry insights. I've given you guys valuable insider info about the context of YouTube and video marketing. I did that in order to build a relationship with you around trust by giving you something upfront at no cost to you and my videos, my content, a thousand videos where I've been doing that over and over continues to serve me and continues to convert with me and for brands that I represent. Resources that no one else is providing. If you're able to give some unique value that nobody else in your niche is giving, if you're able to put things into context in a way that no one else can or come with a different perspective, then that's going to be extraordinarily valuable and that's going to give people the know, like, and trust factor required for you to convert in the first place. So again, you can do product reviews, you can do a process, you can reveal secrets. All these things are the type of thing that ultimately lead to conversions because it's making us more informed. And the secret to converting, if no one's ever said it, is relieve someone's anxiety. If they're on the lot, they want to buy. You, they're asking to give you their money. Are you gonna take it? You know, again, another quote from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Um, so that's the point here. If you can relieve their anxiety, if you can go ahead and if you can resonate with them on an intellectual level where they can rationalize this, an emotional level as well, then you can win and it won't be a problem when it's time for them to open up their wallet. It's not just about content though, it's about community. 
if you have a community that supports whatever you're doing, and if there's a community that you've been providing value for, then you're going to have a much easier time winning them over and continue to have them grow your brand. They will advocate for you to other people. They will become the key component of your sales force without you even having to shell out a salary for it because they will want to continue to spread your message and they will want you to succeed because you invested in them first and you invested in them through this free upfront value in the form of content that they had a desire for, whether that was fun or informative or a combination of both. So how do you build that community? You have to ask some simple questions to answer them. What is the value of each one of my individual videos? What problem does this specific video solve? And who does it solve it for? Who needs this? Why do they need this? And why should they come back here? I often ask people, why should anyone watch your videos? They're like, Roberto, I can't get views. I can't get subscribers. I'm like, why should I watch your videos? And you know what their answer always is to me? Well, I work really hard on them. I'm like, I don't give a crap how hard you worked. You want five minutes of my time. You want five minutes of my time. I could be doing anything. I could be cleaning my office, which I never do. You know, if I wasn't single, I could be making out with a girl right now if I had a girlfriend, which I don't. Hashtag forever alone. Um, the, the, the point is that you're asking for people's valuable time. They could be with their spouse. They could be playing with their kids. They could be making more money. You're demanding their time. Why are you entitled to it? What do they get out of it? What's in it for them? You have to be able to answer these questions. When would this matter to them? Is this a channel that matters to me today because I have this problem? Or is it something that matters to me in the future? Or does it matter to not me, but to someone else in my life? Is this valuable content or information for them? So if you can't answer and qualify these questions about why your content matters, who it matters for, when they would need it, why they should come back, and how are they going to find you in the first place? Are they gonna find me because people are sharing this in Facebook? Are they gonna find me because uh, they're searching for this? Are they gonna find me because they're watching similar people to me? You have to understand these things if you wanna rec really build your community. If you don't have an understanding of what your unique value is to people and what they consider value to be, how can you serve them? How can you hope to sell them? Because that's ultimately the point here. We get ours later if we serve people up front first. We have to seek to serve. And if we do that, then we have the ability to extrapolate value without having to be entitled to it because we earned it. We earned it by delivering and by showing up and by being the best or better or being accessible or being enthusiastic. Just, again, be awesome. So you have to learn to listen in order to accomplish that. You have to ask these questions, but what's the good of asking? If you never listen, if you never listen to people and you never actually truly seek to understand them, then what's the point? What's the point of asking if you don't actually even want to hear it and then take action and do something about it, right? So you have to learn to listen. And you can use other social media as listening appliances, but your comment section is very valuable. And that's the beauty of YouTube versus television. Television is just them dictating to us, just spewing whatever they want our way, and we're never able to truly give our feedback outside of just changing the channel. But with YouTube, we have the opportunity to give a thumbs up, give a thumbs down, and we have the ability to give some context. But you know what else? We have great tools in YouTube called info cards that could let you run a poll, and you could actually ask your viewers, even on their mobile device, how they feel about something. How did you feel about this video? Did, you, did it relate to you? Did it not relate to you? And you could put other and say comment down below. And you can do things like that. You can ask any question you want. And this is an interactive element. And in your YouTube analytics, you can measure the data against it and see how many people voted, how many people voted which way, etc. You can see how many impressions it got, all of those things. Your content is about what you want to communicate and tonality matters and your intentions matter. Are your videos more casual in the way you present something? And even if you're a professional, that could be okay because maybe everyone else in your niche is too stuffy, too buttoned up, not relaxed enough, and they're unrelatable. That could be a real problem in converting and building trust if we just don't feel that connection. So you have to decide, you know, is that something you want to do? Or is it something where everyone's been too casual and no one can take their information seriously? What's the culture of your audience? What is the culture you want to build and who does that matter for? I wanted to build a culture of unifying creative professionals. I could have easily said, you know what, I'll just make a channel for YouTubers only. I'll make a channel for graphic designers. I'll make a channel for photographers or video editors. Ultimately, I decided to build a channel around creative entrepreneurship 
because it's what I believe in and it's the culture that I want to see thrive. I want people to not be starving artists. I want people who want to create great things and put them out into the world and who have good intentions to win and succeed and I want to give them business context on their creativity and their art in a way that maybe no one ever has or no one who's been able to demonstrate for them that they can be successful at the thing that they love, the thing that beats in their chest more than anything else because maybe they've never had that experience in life. You can go ahead and you can have group discussions and inclusion. You can let your community in some way influence or dictate the content you put out there and they will thank you for it because then it's not just all about you and what you want to put out there, but it's about serving them better. And you do that through transparency and you do that by being open. You do that by being willing to go on the record. There are a lot of brands that ultimately, the reason that they're scared of social media is because they will have to be on the record. They will have to be on the public record and they will have to own the thing that they put out there and the thing that they said. But guess what? If you're creating awesome things and putting them in the world, then you have no fear of that ownership. You desire it. So ultimately, you have to look at that and you have to know when do you want to engage. Maybe you don't engage when people are being overtly negative or when it's unwarranted criticism or when they're taking things purposely out of context because ultimately you want to reward good behavior. So maybe you don't respond to every comment and maybe if something is negative, you choose how you respond to it and you decide to take the high road there because then that's representative of your brand. Their negative criticism or unfounded criticism, that's representative of their brand. So if you put that into context, the book by Jay Bear, Hug Your Haters, hashtag not sponsored by Jay, just a friendly shout out, uh, best selling book, one of the leading experts in marketing, his thesis is hug your haters. His thesis is respond to negative criticism with overwhelming positivity, but from an authentic place. And I think you can do that. You can go ahead and say, you know what, I'm sorry that that um, you know, was a negative experience for you. Could you give me some more information as to why? And the thing is, if they ignore that or if they just go on the rampage, well, they're just showing you who they are and everyone else. You've shown people who you are and how you respond and that you're open and you're fair-minded and that you're willing to listen and have the conversation. And that's important because that's what people will say about you when you're not there. Amplify your content. Ultimately, it's great to have this quality content, but you do want it to reach people. Sometimes you need to amplify it. We talked about the fact that you can use other social media platforms to gain more reach and gain more traction. But you can also use influencer marketing to amplify your content. And I know there's skepticism around influencer marketing, but one of the things that you have to realize is that every single one of us just qualified ourselves as an influencer earlier today. We have authority with the people in our life. Some of us, we have employees that we have the ability to influence. Uh, a lot of people here might have been influenced to use Macs or PCs by their mentors, by their supervisors, by their bosses based on their preferences. That's something that happens. So tapping into people in your niche that have that authority and influence, whether it's with a hundred, a thousand, or ten thousand people or more, could be important because at the end of the day, are those sales and customers that are worth having? Are those people worth reaching? And the answer should be yes, because every single one of them is what gets you to a million. You get to a million one person at a time. You get to 100 sales one person at a time. You get to 1,000 sales one person at a time. And we already qualified. Everyone here, for the most part, has influenced a buying decision of someone in their life in the last 30 days. So if you want to amplify your content beyond yourself, use more people that have more reach and more connections with individual human beings. And again, it may not cost you the money you think. If you have a following, you might be able to help those influencers amplify their following and that might be enough to get them to want to work with you. So get creative here. Engagement matters. This is one of my final points. Ultimately, you want to be engaged because no one likes feeling ignored. Everyone likes feeling like they're special and like they matter. So understand that this is not just content. This is content that has the opportunity for you to get feedback, for us to go ahead and say how we feel and why we feel that way. And you can use that as data because that is called sentiment. That is what focus groups, that is what polling, that is what surveys, that is what the, the fees for SurveyMonkey are for. That's what email marketing is for. That's what we pay so much money to understand is how do people feel about what we're doing and can we do it better and can we make it more accessible and can it reach more people? Well, guess what? For free through this content, you can get that data, you can get that information, but then you have to be willing to do something about it. You have to get in the game, you have to be willing to engage with people. 
I have a quick list of resources that you might want to snapshot here, things that can help you with YouTube. I mentioned earlier TubeBuddy and that's the information there to get a discount on it. Uh, I mentioned uh, Rev.com, that's why I use for closed captioning. They can also do translations. Um, Kit.com slash Roberto Blake is um, a place where I have all the hardware that I use to run my YouTube channel in terms of cameras and lighting and so on. I have different builds there. So if that's something that you need for your personal brand, then that's a place that might help you. My YouTube channel is obviously youtube.com slash Roberto Blake two. It is the number two. And then um, you can find me at robertoblake.com. And also if you wanted to join, we have a link there for Awesome Creator Academy. Adobe stock is where I get uh, some of the stock photos for my thumbnails. Cause I talked about making good thumbnails. That is my secret weapon. It is a subscription thing that you have to do, but I find it to be worth it. Graphic stock is a yearly subscription that I also use for some of the images for my thumbnails when I don't take my own photography or commission artists or do any of my own graphic design. Uh, video blocks I use for B-roll and things to give context. Audio blocks is royalty free and that's where I get um, the audio tracks that I mix into my videos as well as my sound effects for sound design. And again, those are usually subscription services. I think some of them are like 99 bucks a year or they're bundled. But ultimately, these are some of the under the hood secret weapons that I use in order to produce my content, edit it better, and it saves me time and they're usually accessible and affordable. Most of them have free trials and things like that. So you can make your own decision, but understand that well, that's what I use, and I use them and it helped me get to a quarter million subscribers and helped me build my business. But more importantly, it saved me a crap ton of time doing those 1,000 videos. So, thank you guys very much. These are my links, and do we have time for any Q&A? Roberto's gonna be here later today, and he's also gonna be here tomorrow to speak, and you've gotta to get to see him on two other panels. So he'll be around to answer questions. I mean, this is pretty amazing, right guys? I mean, seriously good stuff. Thank you so much. I knew he was going to be an expert. You far exceeded my expectations. So glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you.